right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. We're happy to have you with us. See people coming in. All right, great. I see a, a couple of familiar names. So my name is Jared Fitzpatrick. I am on the Canaries team focused on user engagement and outreach. And I'll be your moderator today. I'm also joined by my colleague from Canaries, Stacy Guillen. She's our Director of Business Development. So before we jump in, we have just a few housekeeping items. First, to ensure that everyone can hear during the discussion and there's no distractions, please keep your microphone on mute. And if you do have any audio or video issues, you can message Stacy, and she'll provide some instructions to help you. Second, this is an interactive session and we want to hear your questions. Now you can ask the questions using the Q&A feature during the webinar, and then we'll reserve the last 15 minutes or so to end the session with your questions. Third, this session is being recorded and the recording will be emailed to all attendees after the webinar. Now, while we still have some more people joining, please feel free to share your LinkedIn profile in the chat so you can continue to network and connect with the others in the audience. And I think Stacy is going to send her LinkedIn profile just to get things started. All right, yeah, there we go. Looks good, okay. So I see people still trickling in. I'm just gonna introduce myself one more time for those who just came in. My name is Jared Fitzpatrick again. I'm the Vice President of User Engagement for Canaries. My story, my initial exposure came to diversity and inclusion from leading employee resource groups and managing these large scale organizational transformation projects while I was working as a management consulting in the big four consulting space. And I actually had a brief stint in doing some consulting for higher education clients. So I'm really excited about today's topic and today's speaker. Um, now, when I made that leap into full-time diversity and inclusion work, culture work, I quickly realized that there was a gap between what the initiatives that the companies I was involved in and that I saw were implementing and the actual desired outcomes for attracting, engaging, and retaining people from diverse backgrounds. And that was really where I first found out about Canaries. Now, if you haven't heard of Canaries before, we are a platform with a mission to improve workplace cultures and foster more inclusive environments. Now, on the Canaries platform, people can anonymously provide feedback to their employers on issues related to their lived experiences as people of color or any sort of diversity. People can also share the information related to benefits, employee resource groups, and different policies that their companies have. Now, we at Canaries use that information to help companies make more data-driven decisions about their DNI initiatives. And when companies partner with us, they receive a personalized dashboard that includes tailored DNI metrics that create real change instead of just the check the box initiatives. Uh, and it's pretty cool. So if you have a chance, I encourage you to, after this session, go and visit our website at canaries.com and learn more, or you can connect with Stacy and I afterwards. So as part of our ongoing commitment to support inclusion, we created this multi-part webinar series focused on helping DNI leaders to advance diversity and inclusion during and after this COVID-19 pandemic. Last week, we heard from John Register, and he's one of our Canaries advisors, as well as a disability rights expert. And he talked about how employers are in a unique position to embrace diversity and accelerate disability inclusion in the workplace. Now today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Darren Kelly with us. And Dr. Kelly is the deputy to the vice president for the diversity and community engagement division at the University of Texas at Austin. And today we're going to be discussing how diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders in higher education and academia are responding to COVID-19, specifically focusing on access and equity. Now in his role, Dr. Kelly develops the strategic goals for the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement and advises the Vice President on key decisions regarding budget, personnel, programming, and core administrative functions. He also has specific oversight 
over the academic diversity initiatives and the student diversity initiatives portfolios. Now the academic diversity initiatives portfolio is a complex unit that it consists of three unique centers, the Longhorn Center for Academic Excellence, the Longhorn Center for Community Engagement and the Longhorn Center for School Partnerships. Now, now each of these three units serves to provide academic support, service learning, co-curriculars and college readiness programming to first generation and underrepresented students in their, in their pre-K to PhD educational pipeline. Now, student diversity initiatives portfolio houses the university's gender and sexuality center as well as the Multicultural Engagement Center. In addition to his administrative responsibilities, Dr. Kelly is also an assistant professor of instruction of kinesiology at UT Austin and maintains an active teaching and research agenda in the field of sports management. As a scholar, he conducts research centered around the holistic development of student athletes, specifically African-American student athletes. He currently teaches three classes for the Department of Kinesiology and health education, leadership, and sport, uh, and social aspects of sport and physical activity, and in addition to race and sport in African American life. He also serves as an organizer of the annual Black Student Athletes Summit, a national conference focused on developing and sharing solutions to issues facing collegiate groups of students outside of the traditional classroom setting. In addition to that, there's a lot, uh, he also leads the Urban Economic Development Maymester Program in Cape Town, South Africa. A native of Mission Viejo in California, Dr. Kelly received his undergraduate degree in finance and marketing from the University of Virginia in 2004, and his master's and PhD in kinesiology with a specialization in sports management from the University of Texas at Austin in 2009 and 2012, respectively. He is married to his wife, Paige, and enjoys watching and playing sports with his two sons, Devin and Davis. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Kelly. Let's jump right into it. Um, thank you for having most me, higher yeah. Oh, okay, oh, great, great. Just making sure you can. All right. So most higher education institutions have moved to 100% online delivery formats uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, there are some broad disparities in the availability of high-speed internet service and access to devices for students in underserved and rural communities. Now, many of us on the call probably have heard about the digital divide or the homework gap, uh, but truly we may not know how wide that gap is. So according to the state comptroller, Texas has 2 million households without access to high-speed internet, and that number increases to 20 million when you look nationally, according to the FCC. So my question to you is, how has UT Austin continued to ensure that there is equity in the delivery of education for marginalized student communities? Uh, well, Jared, again, thank you to Canaris for having me join today um, and participate in our webinar. Um, uh, just as everybody may be aware or may not be aware, uh, we got the call and the text, I should say, on Friday the 13th, March 13th, around like 6.37 in the morning that, again, campus was going to be closed until further notice, and that uh, we would have a two-week spring break um, that was extended in order for us to prepare for online distance learning and to uh, make sure that the university can still function, at least in terms of finishing the semester online, um, given the COVID-19 outbreak and pandemic. Um, and, and so this is a real issue because many of the students, like you, like you mentioned, are, do suffer from having, again, the, uh, the digital divide. And um, just for instance, one of the students in my own class that I teach in the spring, currently race and, uh, race and sport and African American life, he could not use internet at his house. He didn't have it. And he had to go to his mom's work in order to be able to use the internet, right? So we know that there are students who had needs um, technology needs, things that are going to help them in terms of being able to finish the semester online. And so since March 13th, the university has actually provided 621 new computers to students in need, um, as well as another $373,000 has been spent on providing other technologies to about 704 students, including hotspots for internet access and other equipment needed. 
Um, just last week alone, we've had an, an additional 105 student applications in process and follow up for further technology needs. So it's real, the commu computers and other equipment needed um, were shipped directly to students. And so the university has really been um, working hard to make sure that students' me needs are met um, when it comes to, again, having the technology to be able to complete courses online, to do their work um, as well. And even if the household does have a computer, they may be sharing it with multiple people and multiple students. So it is important that these students did get their technology needs met uh, and making sure that, again, they have the capabilities to finish the, the school year and the semester online. I love that. I love that. And I'm glad that you all are not just doing the lip service, but you're truly putting the money, the resources behind it to support these students. Now, I just have a quick follow up question there. So we, we talked about some students that are marginalized, but, in, you know, given the, the focus area of what Canaries is all about, we specifically touch on different areas of diversity. And we talked about disabilities last week. Can you, can you share how you're supporting students who may be differently abled? So those who may be deaf or hard of hearing? Absolutely. So um, services for students with disabilities is a unit within our division as well. And once this, the decision was made to move classes online, they immediately updated their website with FAQs and up-to-date information for how professors could then utilize their assistance and services to be able to make sure that their classes are still um, accessible to many folks who are deaf, hard of hearing, or have other um, disabilities. And so um, making sure that all classes have, that needed them have captioning, right, available. And the office worked with our SSD, worked with our provost office, as well as the Faculty Innovation Center, and others to make sure that the needs of students were fully being met. And they, crossed, they were working around the clock over spring break and are still working, even as the semester just completed last week, to making sure that students who have accommodations, who need accommodations, who are still wanting to complete the semester and still have a successful semester in spite of the pandemic um, are able to get the accommodations they need to be able to complete the courses um, in, in, in timely fashion. Man, that's great. Okay, love it. Now, you, you mentioned this, you talked about it a little bit. So your division, the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement, it advances culture, economic development, social impact, and a lot more. Now, we know that the virus is not transmitted based on ethnicity, but there are very disparate health and econ economic impacts for people of color. So how are the different units within your division working together to continue to support their students and, and the community as a whole? Well, absolutely. Certainly the students is our first priority. I'll touch on that, on that a little bit later, but I, I do want to address how we've stepped up to really try to enhance and just continue to serve the community at large here in the greater Austin area. Um, so we have a number of initiatives that focus on disparities within communities of color. And so our division was able to provide between $2,000 and $5,000 worth of funding to about 19 community or different community organizations that are providing direct services um, to those who are affected by COVID-19. Right, so some of these services may include uh, provision of basic needs, basic food needs, technology, um, um, physical and mental health care, housing assistance, care for victims of domestic violence, as we do know that um, unfortunately with, with, with times like this and the pandemic that um, the rates of domestic violence as well as uh, abuse can go up during times like this. Um, also groups that are providing legal assistance, economic and workforce development initiatives. And so these organizations were all nonprofits that we are partnered with for some time and we realized the best way we could help them was through direct funding. And so um, the university allowed us to be able to do that and meet those needs and, and provided the funding to be able to do that. Um, additionally, one of our associate vice presidents is a professor in the School of Nursing. She began a program uh, working with East Austin churches on mental health issues, particularly focused on black males. And so she and her team have now taken that program online are continuing to provide those services, even though they can't go into these communities directly and, and provide these services. Um, our Center for Community Engagement, another one of those areas that we, we mentioned earlier, um, they're continuing its work online as well. So the Texas Grants Resource Center, um, which connects grant seekers and funders, um, has been especially busy as nonprofits continue to struggle to sustain funding for their efforts at this time. And so many of the different trainings, resources, and the allowed use of the database has gone online. And, and so that those nonprofits who are, again, stressed and strained when it comes to funding are able to continue to find um, grant, for, grant sources and grant funders to be able to help provide their services and, and still maintain a great level of support. Um, our Hawk Foundation for Mental Health, another major agency and auxiliary within our organization, they've done a ter terrific job of sharing resources and coping, we're coping with COVID via podcasts and uh, online links. And so um, 
uh, they've put out literature as well as uh, ways that folks can listen to find ways that they can just sustain their mental health and, and be well, even in the time of crisis for many people when they're wondering what are they going to do about food on the table for the next day or how are they going to find work again, even when the pandemic has gone away and the economy bounces back. And so, um, you know, our, our units have stepped up in a tremendous way um, to continue to serve the needs of the community in spite of the challenges that exist. Um, but going back to, again, kind of what we really feel as really the home of what we do as, as DDCE is really serving our students and serving our diverse students is, is really the biggest priority that we have. And so we've dedicated to their well-being. Um, we've been dedicated to their well-being over the past two, uh, two months, um, providing all of our services online. Um, for instance, you mentioned the Gender and Sexuality uh, Center earlier. They did some fundraising on their own to continue to have emergency funding and fundraising done for um, students they support. Um, so many students may not necessarily have the best home to go out to go to because of their identity, right? And so making sure that those students of need are, are still able to find housing on campus, off campus, maintain, um, you know, their, their daily basic needs. Our UT elementary school, right? We have a larger division that's across the whole state of Texas. And one of those is a charter school um, here in Austin uh, called UT elementary school. They provide a technology to students who need to students who need a computer or a hotspot in order to participate in online learning. And they're also providing packets to families who would prefer to learn on a paper format. So again, we're being as flexible as possible to really try to meet those needs, um, to get um, the information to people that need it, uh, the resources to people those need it, the organizations that need it, and, and making sure that again, um, even in a time like this, we can come together to help others in need. Man, I love it. And I can tell you're passionate about it and you know your stuff. And I didn't say this at the beginning, but you're looking sharp today. And so I hope I hope everybody recognizes that you know you you are you're on it today. All right, so you are a natural leader. You can tell we've talked before this, and I can tell I can feel that off of you. Um, but specifically as a diversity and inclusion leader, you're responsible for addressing discrimination, harassment, bullying, any of those issues that happen on campus, especially when we talk about you know the the students really being the core of what your your focus is. So I know at, at many college campuses and specifically at UT Austin, there are large immigrant populations um, that, that live on campus. And I know at UT there's a significant Asian student population. Um, now in your role, have you seen increased discrimination or xenophobia against students of Asian descent? Uh, and if you have, what steps are you taking to protect those students? Sure thing, uh, that's a good question, um, certainly. Um, given, um, you know, the origins of COVID-19 and certainly that because it originated in China and, you know, people honestly er erroneously and um, racistly referring to it as a, a, um, a Chinese flu or the Kung flu and those very derogatory terms when it comes to referring to this, it certainly I think has, has like you said, uh, seen an uptick in bias reports. And so we, we uh, have a, a bias reporting incident, uh, bias incident reporting system called the Campus Climate Resource um, Task Force. And um, that um, unit is formed to be, able to be able to respond to different bias incidents that are reported around the university and that's through an online system. And so since um, COVID-19 as, as the pandemic started, we've seen an uptick of about 20 reports when it comes to bias incidents regarding Asian and Asian Americans on, on the campus community. So most have been the online comments, you know, obviously since we're not in uh, on campus, it's pretty much been through social media or other kind of uh, online formats. Um, uh, we have at least one case where the commenter was actually posing as a university student, but they turned out to not be a student at all. And so our campus climate response team has responded to these incidents uh, with support and resources to victims. Um, the Center for Mental Health um, and services has been counseling students who for student um, has been counseling available has counseling available for students who um, via Zoom as well as phone to any students who have experienced these kind of incidents. Um, at this time, we actually have not um, been able to issue a public statement um, regarding these concerns. Though our dean of the College of Liberal Arts uh, released a statement early on, but one of the concerns that we do have as 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 a university is that we are as a public and state institution. You know, we um, you know we're watched carefully by groups who. Um, are, are saying that the university is putting a damper on free speech. And we want to make sure that not only are we following the, the, lo the law of the land and the law of the state, um, but we are, we are sensitive to that because we are under two um, different lawsuits right now currently going. And so I think that may explain the hesitation, at least from the president's office perspective to really address this with a public wide statement. But certainly we have a number of different forums going on supported by um, a number of different groups of resource groups, um, 
university resource groups like an Asian Asian American family faculty and staff association putting on town halls webinars. Uh, again, we have resources to be able to respond to these kind of incidents and, and we're certainly taking an active look to make sure that again the folks who are experiencing these have the support they need to be able to um, continue to be a student um, faculty member staff member or community member here at the University of Texas. Now, I know I'm going a little bit off script here, but we just received a question that I think is directly related to what you just talked about. And rather than waiting till the end, I just kind of wanted to throw it in now. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the audience members said, you know, they're, they're very interested in the bias response team that you mentioned and how it's continued to exist with the recent legislation around free speech because they're struggling with a similar issue in, in their workplace. Um, can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, our, our, our response team has been around since about 2014, I believe, 2013, 2014 is when we started to uh, roll out our, our, our campus climate response team. And, you know, it, it, it used to, um, you know, we, we have to be, obviously, we're careful in terms of the way we act. And we've had some issues where folks have thought that, you know, had our CCRT team has come under scrutiny with regards to how they respond to incidents. But in the era, in, in the era, in terms of trying to really make sure that people understand how we work, we've been a little bit more transparent, not only with our reporting. Um, so we put out an annual report every year in terms of the bias report, the incidents that we get, the number of incidents, what types they are and so forth. Um, certainly without going into too much detail in order to keep privacy um, you know, at bay, but also um, we've gone to uh, a regular reporting system where we, we're putting out updates on that every week in terms of the different incidents we get. So we are trying to be as transparent as possible to see that again, um, not only are we responding to these incidents, but again, it's not necessarily us um, trying to prohibit or, or prevent free speech, um, but it's just a matter of how we respond when we're providing resources to students, um, staff, staff, faculty, um, and community members who do have concerns. Um, and that we are hearing those things out, right? We, our campus climate response team does not necessarily have any um, authority to carry out decisions when it comes to any kind of punishments or um, or, or um, decisions that are made when when students or, or people in the community uh, within the university community make those incidents. So those are actually doled out to um, the responsible authorities, whether it be in financial administrative services under our um, chief financial officer who oversees all of our staff, whether it's the provost office and if it needs to be referred to, if it's a faculty issue or uh, if it's a student issue, referring it out to our vice president for student affairs and their division to be able to handle any adjudication that needs to come down when it comes to making decisions on that. But our, our role and responsibility as campus climate um, response team is to make sure that there is, a, there is a way to communicate these concerns, to be able to voice these concerns, to be able to follow up on them, to be able to get help with them, uh, and find resources that will be able to work through it, but also inform us as university leaders to be able to find and create and craft um, and shape new policy that's going to make sure that we, you know, try to promote as much um, diversity and inclusion on the campus as possible. That's great. And I love that. And I love that you talked about hearing the voice of the student and constantly listening to that voice. Um, that's one of the tenets of what we do at Canary is we, you know, we design surveys and we tailor them to listen to the voice of the employee or the student or whoever that population might be. So one of the things that we've been seeing as, as a trend is more and more companies, um, higher education institutions, uh, they're surveying their staff, their faculty, but and also their students about their well-being during COVID. Now, you, you talked about listening to the voice of the student. Have you done any data gathering to understand the experience of what your students or faculty are going through right now? Uh, and if you have, have you seen any trends? Yeah. Um, well, certainly, the first one of the first things we wanted to do was get student feedback, and I, I, I applaud our Longhorn Center for Academic Excellence, which houses all of our academic success programs that work directly with students. Um, they immediately went on on, on the offensive and, and, and created a survey to send out to the students to see what their needs were. How are they transitioning to online classes? How are they doing? Just how are they? How is their mental and health and well-being? Their physical well-being. Um, their situation when it comes to their home life. And so we found that through though that survey, we found a number of students were extremely anxious about COVID and rightfully so. And that being home with their family sometimes increased the stress of performing academically, right? A number of them are being called upon to babysit and teach younger siblings. If parents are still working, maybe they're in essential, um, just essential jobs and they, uh, or even if they're working from home. I mean, I can tell you from my own personal experience with a five and a six year old, trying to teach kids and work full time at the same time, um, is, is pretty impossible, 
right? Trying to have webinars like this and constantly looking on my shoulder to make sure my kids aren't interrupting, um, trying to get them to sit down and do a worksheet or do an online lesson. Um, it's hard to focus. And so I can imagine if, um, if young, if students, right? If our students are having to do these responsibilities and are still trying to go to class and are still trying to get it on the internet and having internet troubles because everybody's hogging up the internet because of their devices, right? That could be stressful. That could be frustrating when you're trying to get the work done and you don't have a quiet space or even a space to yourself to do that, right? And so others, other students were struggling um, because their parents lost their jobs. And so money is now being an issue in terms of how to continue to support the, um, the journey of going to school, um, but also knowing that, hey, your, your whole family is just worrying, worrying about where the next paycheck is gonna come from. Um, some students are trying to get out of leases here in Austin, right, in terms of being able to hopefully break a lease and so they can go back home since they're not going to be in school on campus. But again, that 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 process, especially for students off campus, could be pretty frustrating and could get pretty expensive when it comes to actually doing that. Um, and so many didn't have the technology they needed or their families only had one computer or no internet. So it, 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 the struggle is real. And I, if you could see the stress on the students' faces, you know, when you are happen to zoom in with the students for a meeting or uh, for a class and, and it's, it's, struck. it's tough. And I think we all have to continue to band together and tell us how we're collectively going through it, but certainly and empathizing with our students. I think, first of all, we really need to listen and empathize, but then how can we create solutions? How can we provide those resources that are gonna help our students? And I think our, our university is doing a pretty good job. Certainly, I think we can always improve and it's all hard to pivot in the middle of a semester, but I really will give give our leadership credit in terms of making sure that there were resources that, again, the process to get these resources wasn't too convoluted um, and that, you know, students are receiving equipment. They are receiving funding um, to help pay for rent. They are receiving help with food insecurities, right? And so, you know, we're responding um, and we're responding even within our own center, right? So the university as a whole is providing these services through our student emergency fund, but even our units within DDC are going, um, are, are going to bat specifically with the students that we serve to making sure that they have the resources they need in order to continue to be a student. And that's that's fantastic. And and you talked about some things that that I hadn't even thought about. Things like breaking leases. I mean that those are stressors that are very real. But we just kind of underlying some of the other things. That's that's good. Okay. So so we know that you you have an amazing response already to what's going on during the pandemic. But once this pandemic ends, and it will end, there's going to be some lasting effects on higher education. So what are some of the long-term impacts of COVID-19 you expect to see in academia? And we won't hold you to this. So, you know, this is just your opinion. <laughs> so we're not going to hold the UT to this, but no, what do you I'm think? Um, yeah, I mean, no doubt funding is going to be a huge issue, right? You've already seen many universities announce um, budget cuts, announce furloughs, announce, you know, staff reduction and layoffs, which is never a fun thing, never an easy thing to do, right? Given the circumstances, it's, it's one thing that the university is going to have to consider is all options may be on the table in terms of how do we overcome a budget shortcom, shortfall that is a result of this pandemic, right? Um, as you may be aware, may even not be aware, the University of Texas system and Texas A&M are both received funding from the state's permanent university fund which is very much tied to oil revenues. A couple of weeks ago, oil went negative in terms of oil prices, right? So the oil industry has tanked and when it comes to the oil prices and a lot of, again, the university's fund is tied towards how oil prices are doing. So not only can we expect a, a reduction in terms of revenues that are coming from our permanent university fund, but you know, given um, the lack of uh, or, the, or, or the gap in terms of you know, a whole lot of sales tax probably not gonna come through um, because of this economic concern, uh, we could probably expect that when the legislature meets next spring, that we are probably not going to get as much funding that we would hope for when it comes to uh, higher education um, uh, overall. And so we just honestly have to be prepared for some tough times and some tough decisions that have to be made. But certainly I know with our leadership, especially in our division, the number one priority is making sure that, again, our people can have positions. You know, we want to make sure we take care of people first and we don't necessarily want to have any kind of layoffs or furloughs. But for going from there, it may, it may re it result in some tough decisions that have to be made. Um, you know, we're preparing for a very different fall semester than what we're probably accustomed to, right? Um, being on campus, you know, usually um, uh, uh, when we're approaching a new fall semester, um, upcoming football seasons coming around the corner, Folks are excited, new students are on campus, new freshmen. 
everybody's excited and there's a buzz in the air, well, it's going to be a little bit different. There may not be as many students coming back to the uh, to campus. There may be a hybrid approach when it comes to having students both um, taking courses online and a certain amount of students who are actually on campus taking classes um, in person. Um, what's it going to be like for faculty and staff who have um, who are immunocompromised? Um, are they going to feel comfortable coming back right after this pandemic um, when it comes to their own health and safety concerns, as well as the students who may be in the same situation? So our classrooms are going to look different. Our offices are going to look different. We're going to continue to try to find ways to promote spatial and social distancing. Um, but you know that's going to that's going to force a lot of our large classes again probably to go online if, if necessary. Um, trying to find large spaces on campus in order to have you know small class sizes. I mean. We got to make sure that you know students and, and faculty and staff have the opportunity to be able to ha have that distance so that we're not continuing to promote the spread of the pandemic if it's still around. And so that's going to result in some challenges logistically when it comes to course scheduling, when it comes to um, how people enter course classrooms, how people exit classrooms, where they sit in the classrooms. Um, and so having fewer people on campus at one time is also a major concern um, with discussions around longer times between classes. Um, where students can't necessarily rush into class while others are leaving classes, creating those bottlenecks and, you know, again, um, not promoting distance. Our recruiting is likely going to change. Um, you know, it has been in, in the past couple of months, we haven't have been able to have a campus tour. So people can't see, you know, where they're going to see themselves for the next four years. And it's only result, uh, we, we can only do virtual tours. And so, you know, what effect is that going to have on admissions and how we recruit students and how we do recruit a diverse student body that promotes, again, an inclusive campus? Um, and so fundraising, fundraising is going to have to change. You know, we had to cancel major fundraising events in light of this, and we can't do fundraising in the same way because, again, we can't always have the space to put people in small spaces. And so how do we, how do we utilize online platforms? How do we utilize other mechanisms to be able to still bring in the fundraising dollars that we critically need, especially for a lot of our units within DDCE who depend on, again, our UT Elementary School, they put on an annual fundraiser where they're getting in annual funds to help promote and provide funding for a lot of their educational initiatives. With that going away, we got to find a new way. And so it's going to be a challenge in terms of how we respond and how we develop new pathways to, to, to fundraise and, and especially meet some of these shortcomings and, and, and gaps that we're going to experience because of this. But if anything, you know, we've learned just how to be flexible, how to be nimble, um, and, and when called upon. And then yeah, I think these skills will help us in terms of how we continue to operate in a changing economy in future. Are uh, you dropping knowledge left and right. I mean, just, I'm writing, I don't know if you see me, I'm writing notes over here because there's so much wisdom that you just shared there. Um, and, and so I wanna leave it open for, for questions. I know we've had a couple of questions come in already. I think you answered one or two of those questions just with that response around the financial and budgetary impacts um, that COVID has had. Uh, I know there was one more question around, you know, just how are, the budgetary impacts of all that you did to help the students i mean buying laptops and all that i don't know if there was if you felt that right away or if that was a hard decision to make recognizing that there may be tough times ahead so was that a difficult decision to to spend that additional money to support the students or was it kind well, of a no-brainer yeah for, first and foremost i mean you know i think again we're a very student-centered organization and i think yeah. you know, we that trickle that trickles all the way down to everybody who's on the front lines, especially. But certainly, our leadership is always thinking about the student need, students' needs and how they respond to our services that we provide. So, um, yeah, it's a tough decision when it comes to trying to allocate other resources for for students. But it's really a no brainer when you think about it. If you have the funding and, and we, we, you know, one of the things is we don't have as much. We're not spending as much because we're not doing as much when it comes to actual physical events, when it comes to catering and food that you always have at events and um, travel, right, has certainly um, significantly gone down. So there is a little bit of savings that we can use now, you know, we still want to be able to save for a rainy day, which we do know a rainy day is around the corner. So right. we are prudent of that, but certainly, um, you know, when it comes to helping meet the needs of students, I think we, you know, our staff really want to do as much as possible. And, and it's not just on us. I mean, certainly the university has, has really taken a stride and effort to do that, you know, once um, once we realize that, you know, these student needs are going to be a, a critical in terms of trying to fulfill, um, the university stepped up and our president stepped up in leadership and making sure that we started this uh, fund to build up student emergency services. Um, you know, we, we were able to raise, I think, close to about a million dollars just from gifts from outside from alums, as well as um, staff, community members who wanted to give. And the president um, was willing to match up to $2 million, right? So as, as, more, as much as we keep on raising money, it's going to be matched dollar for dollar up to $2 million. 
And so again, additionally, and, and, and also utilizing the funds that we're getting um, through the CARES Act to make sure that students are getting these needs, like these, you know, we, we wanna make sure that we're using all the resources we're capable of using to help meet students and, and, and try to raise more if we can to make sure that if, we, if there are any shortcomings that, hey, we can, we can still um, help students um, reach their goals academically and, and still have a good experience as a University of Texas student. That's good, okay. Now you, you touched on something really important there. So you you have a huge alumni base that has allowed you to maintain some of those funds and you're still getting some of the state funds. There are some smaller universities or private universities um, nat nationwide, but even in, especially in Texas that may not make it out of these tough times ahead may fail to reopen. Um, now we may see some mergers with larger academic institutions or we may just see them close. So there's gonna be some students potentially who are displaced because their school either no longer can uh, afford to stay open or it has been absorbed into a larger system. Um, how would you, are you expecting to see that st students come to your system because of that? Um, how would you suggest supporting students that may have been displaced from their, their university? Um, I can suspect that's going to happen uh, for a number of places. Um, you know, certainly it, it's going to be hard with a place like UT right now, um, given that we have about 51,000 students, at least from our president, our outgoing president, and what I know from our um, interim president designate. Um, you know, we, we've been operating at capacity and there has been um, a push to not necessarily continue to expand in light of uh, the amount of resources it would take to continue to, you know, operate and provide um, you know, curriculum and support and, 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 and take on more students. And so we've been sensitive to that. And so um, it would be interesting to see exactly what policy is going to come down when it comes to transfer students and students who are coming from situations like that. I'm not, I'm not necessarily privy to those discussions. That's above my pay grade right now. But, you know, I would be encouraging of at least having some kind of policy or way that we can uniquely look at the situation of students who are in these situations where they're forced to leave their university because it closes or a merger prevents them from, you know, maybe their schools merge, but they get rid of a major or something like that, or um, the credits they need to do out of this new merger, you know, change in terms of the actual finish line for their degree. So, you know, I would certainly work, you know, in, in terms of helping and working with admissions to see if there is some kind of unique way that we can at least evaluate these students when it comes to be able to considering them for UT Austin. I think um, you know, our system schools will have an opportunity, but I think, you know, there's the opportunity for higher education and institutions to come together, at least from a geographical perspective, to be able to hopefully help out some of those universities, right? We have the oldest university in Austin, um, historically black college, um, Houston Tillerson University, right up the street in Austin, Texas. And I know it, this is going to be a tough time for them, but certainly I would think because of our proximity, um, that we could work with them to be able to help make sure that they can, uh, can hopefully still keep the doors open and doesn't necessarily may mean, it may not necessarily mean a, um, a direct financial support, but maybe there's a way that hopefully we can work with them, work with our local community colleges to make sure that we can fill in the gaps of classes that students may need until Houston Tillerson gets back on their feet. But again, I'm not as privy to their situation um, as ours, um, but certainly I would hope that in the spirit of, you know, um, again, the, the true purpose of higher education and making sure that, again, students have access to be able to fulfill and, and, and reach their goals, that hopefully universities can work together to address the needs of those students who are in a bit of limbo because of their university situation. Good. Awesome. And I love hearing that you would be willing to help out Houston Tillotson. That's a great school. Um, so we have a question, a couple of questions in, and I want to make sure that we have time to get to them. So the first question I'm reading here is your division, the you know, division diversity and community engagement is doing great work, clearly. How are you promoting a culture of accountability across all units on campus to build that inclusive university environment? Well, I think it starts from the leadership and I think we have a great vice president and leader that you know really you know not only talks the talk but walks the walk when it comes to um, you know diversity and inclusion and finding ways to be able to incorporate that not only in our actual administrative duties but certainly even in the classroom in terms of the classes he teaches on um, the way he operates his classroom the may makes uh, students feel welcome in his presence uh, being student centered and having student centered approach um, so leadership I think helps dictate that um, the other thing is that you know we have a university diversity and inclusion action plan um, UDAP for short is what we call it but as part of that UDAP that we established back in 2017 which holds us accountable and we have annual updates to that 
uh, where it sees with the we, people can see the progress we're making on the different goals and the objectives that we have as a part of that plan. So that certainly helps in, part of, in, in terms of accountability. But I can I can I can thankfully say that every um, college and school and unit on campus has a person who's over diversity and inclusion for that specific unit. So whether it's in the College of Natural Sciences, whether it's in the Cone School of Business, whether it's in uh, the College of Education, uh, we have um, a, either an assistant or associate. Um, Dean, uh, who is over diversity inclusive and inclusion initiatives within um, that college or school. And so those folks regularly communicate amongst each other. They are in communication with our vice provost for um, diversity. So not only do we have a vice president for diversity uh, who runs the division of diversity and community engagement, we have a vice provost for diversity who's really concerned about faculty affairs and making sure that um, everything from a faculty perspective when it comes to faculty diversity um, is in play and is being supported by the university. And so those two, um, those two individuals work very closely together to make sure that we're covering all flanks, whereas the vice provost is handling all faculty affairs, we're taking care of the needs of not only students and community members, as well as uh, staff members on campus as well. Awesome, okay. Uh, and then I think this will be probably our last uh, question. So what is your strategy or the, the university strategy, I guess, and this may be a little bit bigger than just the, the division that you work in, but what's your strategy for infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion into the curriculum for students and also training employees in this new setting? Uh, well, one of the things that we actually rolled out this year um, was a, a comprehensive diversity certificate initiative um, within the division. We worked closely with HR to provide um, a, a set of about 10 um, sessions that folks can take. And they can take as little or as many as they want. They can take all 10 to get a, set, uh, to get a certificate. Um, they can just take one, two, or three that they feel like meet the best needs. But from things like uh, LGBTQ and allyship, uh, ally training, to uh, understanding cultural diversity in the workplace, to understanding what's campus climate, what does campus climate mean, right? It's not the weather, that's literally the, the topic of the course. Talking about the history of racism in the United States. Um, so we have a number of different sessions that folks can take from all over campus. Um, those were in person originally, um, and those of course have been rolled out through Zoom and through our, um, our UT training portal um, so that folks can get on live and get on a session to be able to kind of continue to uh, get more training about um, diversity issues and, and really fill in some of those gaps where they feel like, hey, I'm strong in this area, but I need to be able to have some additional information on this particular topic, right? So um, we're still offering those. We also have uh, an inclusive classrooms training that we partner with Provost Office on to provide an inclusive classroom training to um, not only uh, faculty, but also uh, teaching assistants and um, assistant instructors who often are doing a lot of the work face-to-face -face with many of the students. Um, in, in, uh, in our classrooms. And so making sure that they have the tools to be able to, again, promote inclusivity within the classroom, within even thinking about it in their curriculum and how they shape the curriculum through uh, includes having inclusive uh, text and um, content that will appeal and hopefully be um, account for as many or diverse um, backgrounds as possible. And so um, we're doing our best. And again, it's, 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 it's been a long time coming. Our division started in 2007. And so this is, uh, you know, 13 years in the making. And, and so we still have a ways to go in terms of really trying to continue to work with all of our different partners. But we believe we have the right people in place. We believe we have the mechanisms in place um, to help all of our units and schools on campus be able to, um, you know, become more inclusive and have more um, training and tools to be able to, uh, again, um, not just talk about how we, how we care about diversity, but actually put into action. Awesome. Now, is that 10 course training available only to internal university employees? Currently, yes, that is currently uh, an internal training mechanism. But again, to your point, and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, we are, and then this was the, 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 we were at the time developing also an ex external form that we would roll okay. out, and work with different groups and organizations that wanted to get some of our trainings and things of that nature. Um, we had to put that on hold because again, we had to ship this online and making sure that all right. of our other services and supports uh, we're ready to go when it comes to our um, our office, but it is something we have in the plans in order to roll out soon. Yes, please let me know when that rolls out. I will be there. <laughs> All right. So I know we're almost at time. I did want to just uh, allow you a few minutes. If there's any final thoughts or resources that you'd like to share with the audience, please feel free to do so. Uh, no, thank you. I, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us for today's webinar. I think, um, you know, for those of you who 
are directly in this work or, or, or indirectly in this work. I think, you know, this is something we need to make sure that we're continuing in spite of what's happening with the pandemic. And then this is something that can't go to the wayside. Um, you know, it's very important and critical, I think, especially for institutions where, um, again, the budget cuts are really gonna hit hard. Um, we really have to continue to support each other and support and advocate for um, the effectiveness and the usefulness and the need for diversity and inclusion, um, training, support, staff, um, at these institutions, right? This is not something that should be suffering the brunt of huge cutbacks given um, the pandemic, but it's something that we need to make sure there's a continued investment in. And so I would just encourage everyone to keep on fighting the fight, to keep on um, using the data that you have and developing the data that you need to be able to support um, and continue to sustain your programs and efforts. Um, and then one thing I also wanna just plug real quickly is that I know we've talked a little bit about a number of things that we've done um, as a division um, in response to COVID-19, but I do want to point everyone out that we do have a report that we released a couple weeks ago called um, DDCE Interrupted, um, and it's uh, um, interrupt, uninterrupted DDCE during the age of COVID-19, and that just lays out um, the many different ways that our units had to quickly pivot uh, to continue to provide the essential and critical services that um, students, faculty, staff, community members needed during this pandemic, and so um, certainly, uh, if, if, if you want to take a look at that, please feel free to Google uninterrupted DDCE during the age of COVID-19 um, if you want to find out more information. And I will drop a link as well in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. And we will send that out as well with the webinar recording. Uh, but I just before this call, I started reading through it. It's, it's really great. So I hope that everyone takes a look at that. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for being with us today. You are a wealth of knowledge. I'm going to watch this again because I didn't feel like I got all the notes that I wanted, but this was, this was amazing. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees as well for sharing your time with us, especially those that ask thoughtful questions. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, now, our next webinar will be on Tuesday, May 19th. We'll be discussing the intersectionality between for-profits and not-for-profits during COVID-19. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn for news about DNI trends and updates on future webinars. All right, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Have an amazing day. Bye bye. Thank you.